Well, it's time for another tutorial, and in this video, I'm going to be covering the process of casting up a rigid armature of my own head using a resin, using TC-808, and rigid foam to back it. And then, of course, embedding a pipe so I can screw that onto my workbench and use this as a sculpting armature. Now, the mold that I'm going to be pulling this from is an old silicone mold that I made, I think, probably in a mold making workshop, probably back uh, well over 20 years ago. And one of the problems with this particular mold is this was pulled off of a life cast of me, originally an UltraCal 30 uh, head cast of me. And it didn't have any kind of flange there around the base of the neck. So the problem with that is, I mean, while yes, it's a workable mold, that allows resin and foam to get in between and cause distortions and just makes a big mess right around the neck where you're casting into that. Not the end of the world. Obviously, I've used this mold a lot. It served me well. But ideally, in a recent tutorial where I made a similar head mold, you notice how I made that flange around the base. And this is for that uh, head bucket video that I posted a while back. And you see there that flange around the top. What that does is that prevents that casting material from getting down between the mother mold and the brush on silicone mold. And that, of course, was made using TC5110F thickened with the SC5001. So definitely check out that video if uh, you're new to that process. But real important there, that flange really helps make for a much tidier uh, casting experience, especially when we're going to be doing rotational casting by hand, like you'll see me doing here in a little bit. So that's how I would have preferred this mold to be made. But again, this is one that I made on the fly uh, at least 22 years ago or so. I think originally we did that head cast of me in uh, the summer or fall of 2003. So here's our mold. This again, this is an old silicone mold. Don't have to use mold release on it, but if we were to use mold release, we would use the E302. That is a paintable mold release, which is easy to remove the residue from the cast part. But real important to consider that when you're making a, a resin part like this, if you're going to be doing any painting or any work over the top that uh, needs to bond to that resin, be careful about the mold release you use so you don't wind up creating a barrier that's impossible to remove. So E302 is an excellent release to use for that purpose. Now, for our skin, shall we say, of resin inside this mold, I'm going to be using TC-808. This is one I've used in several previous tutorials. And TC-808 is kind of my go-to for this kind of thing. It's a very moisture-resistant, fast-setting formula, and it is incredibly strong. And it works really well for this kind of hand rotational casting, like you'll see here. Because you don't want a, a resin with a really long working time if you're going to be hand rotationally casting, because otherwise you will be there way too long, and I really don't want a CrossFit workout. I want to get my parts done. So TC-808 is, of course, mixed one-to-one -one by weight. And this normally just cures bright white, but of course you can add pigments to it. And it's also available in a jet black formula for those of you uh, doing automotive applications or sculptural applications that require a black resin. Now, once I get my resin mixed up, remember this is a fairly fast working time. TC-808 has about a two and a quarter minute working time and then about a 10 to 20 minute demold. So pretty fast turnaround time. And we're actually going to do two layers of this to make sure we get a nice skin coat on the inside of my mold. So I'm gonna pour that in. You see, I've just secured this mold with some packing tape and more about that later when I get to the foam pouring stage. But I secured that with packing tape and now I'm gonna keep that mixing cup handy and slosh that around in any of that excess resin I want to pour back out into the cup. And I'm actually going to do that a couple of times, and it is going to get a little bit on the messy side, but that's okay. This uh, little uh, piece of wood that I'm working on is just for that purpose. It's going to go to uh, wood shop heaven when we're done with this video. So see, I'm rotating there as I pour it back out into the mixing cup. And that way I retain that extra resin and I can pour it back in. But that's the best way to make sure that I get the base of the neck coated really well with resin uh, when you're hand sloshing it. So just know when you're hand sloshing a mold like this, it is going to get a little bit messy. And that's why ideally when you're making molds for this process, make sure you take all of that into consideration and you engineer the mold so that it works well for the process you're going to be using. Now, once I've gotten it coated all over the inside of the mold, I'm just going to keep it moving by hand 
for that the entire working time. So again, this has a working time of about two to two and a quarter minutes at room temperature. Remember, hot weather will speed it up, cold weather will slow it down. So just remember that if you're working in the winter doing this, you're probably gonna have a little bit more working time with it, summertime a little bit less, but if you're in a climate controlled area, typically you're gonna have two and a quarter minutes to slosh that around, just seeing if you're paying attention. And then about a 10 to 20 minute demo. Now, because I'm going to be doing two layers of this, I just need this to gel and then I'm going to start with that second layer. So it doesn't need to be set up to a, a point where it can be demolded. It just needs to gel enough that it's not moving around on the inside of the mold. And you can use the leftover resin in your mixing cup to help you check that. So that's one of the reasons I keep that mixing cup standing by there. I can use that to check and see if it's ready for the next layer. And it is, so we're gonna go ahead and mix up another layer. And I figured you saw the mixing process once, you don't need to see it again. This is a slightly larger batch. And one thing to be aware of when you're working like this, where you're doing layers of resin, is remember that that first layer is going to exotherm or release heat. And that exotherm, that heat coming off that first layer of resin will help accelerate the second layer of resin. So you wanna be aware of that and know that you're gonna have slightly less working time sloshing that around than you did on the first layer. So again, here I poured it out the neck a little bit to get it coated on the inside of the neck really well. And then I'm sloshing it around and every now and then I turn it upside down like that just so I can make sure I get some of those uh, undercut areas filled really well with resin. So sloshing that around, and again, don't worry about that wooden tabletop. It's about to go to woodworking heaven. So um, any little spills on that are not an issue at all. Now, this is about an hour later. I usually like to let the resin sit for at least an hour or so, so it's really nice and strong and doesn't distort from any of the pressure of the foam. But either way, this is one of the reasons I wanted to make this video is this is one of those processes that uh, you want to be careful about when you're using a really soft mold like this because this is a soft, stretchy silicone mold that I'm using. And especially if you're doing something like this with the 5110F where you have a soft, stretchy, one-piece silicone mold, um, when it comes time to cast foam into that, you can do it, but uh, you need to be very careful that you don't overload the mold with foam and cause the mold to distort. So by sloshing around the two layers of resin, that helps secure everything and secure the shape of the part. But what I'm doing next here is uber important. Now I'm using TC300. This is in the six pound density. And I've mixed up a batch that's just enough that I can slosh it around and coat the inside of that head. But I'm not trying to fill up the head entirely. And a lot of this comes from experience of just knowing what uh, different molds will take to fill them. So this was about a, I think this was about a 400 gram batch of foam. So I want enough foam that I could get a, a generous coating on the inside of that resin surface but I don't want so much foam that I just fill up the entire head. And the reason for that is I want the foam to expand into the head and not push out against that mold because that is such a soft silicone mold. I don't want that to create distortions on the, on the mold as it expands and pushes out. Now all of the foam specs, you can find all the foam specs and everything at bjbmaterials.com. So those of you asking about a lot of the physical properties, more beyond what I have to say in the video, definitely check out their website. Again, that's bjbmaterials.com. Now I'm gonna go ahead and let that set up, but you see the inside of that is now coated, but it's still hollow. And the reason that's important is if I just filled up the mold with foam, because that is such a soft silicone, even with that resin shell, that foam generates a massive amount of pressure and can easily distort the mold. So that's one of the reasons why I slosh coated that. And then the expansion of the foam actually pushes into the mold instead of out because it's gonna go with the path of least resistance. And that's one of the reasons we can get away with just securing this mold with packing tape. Because if I just did packing tape and dump foam in this, it would pop that mold right open. So real important to be aware of that, be aware of the pressure of the foam and what I'm doing here is I've just mixed up another small batch I'm just sloshing it around just a little bit there at the base just enough so I can embed that piece of pipe there at the end and the elbow you don't have to put an elbow on there but I did that just to secure it a little bit extra I had that extra little pipe elbow sitting around and uh, put that whole assembly in 
while the foam is expanding. And then of course that foam, because it sticks to everything, it will grab onto that pipe and hold everything in place. And now we have a very nice secure arrangement and you wanna be careful because again, that generates a lot of pressure. So I actually have to hold that down a little bit to keep the foam from just pushing that pipe up out of the mold. Now, important to note about ventilation, I'm working in a well-ventilated shop and water blown systems do not release any kind of poisonous, toxic, horrible gases. So you do wanna work in a well-ventilated work area like you would do with any of these materials, but it's not like the old school foams that are going to cause a mass casualty event if you use them in an enclosed area. So any questions about that, further questions about foam and the chemistry thereof, you can always check the BJB website. Now you see there, see how that uh, seam stayed intact. It wasn't spread apart by the pressure of the foam. And that is all because I did that slosh layer of the foam rather than just dumping foam into the mold and letting it fill up the entire head. So not only did we have a much more conservative use of foam, we also didn't create an overpressure condition that uh, distorted that mold. So that way we get a much truer casting uh, to the original shape of my head. And here you see why that flange is so important that I did on the more recent mold is it does lock up a little bit. It does grab some of that extra material. We'll grab that shell a little bit. But uh, now that we've got our mother mold removed, we are ready to turn that inside out and peel that off. And now we have a resin and foam copy of my head ready for sculpting. And some of you might be wondering why I did this instead of say a pottery plaster, UltraCal 30 or HydroCal positive. And the main reason is this is more chip resistant. It's not going to break or crack if it falls off my workbench and it's easy to clean up. I can do uh, cleanup work on this just with a razor knife or X-Acto Dremel tool to clean up any little air bubbles on this. And once that's all cleaned up, it's ready to go. And one of the other nice things about this is clay sticks to this much better. So obviously you can prepare a plaster armature to take clay, no problem, but uh, Oil-based clay works really well over a polyurethane resin surface like this. Now, in addition to using this as a sculpting armature, I can also archive this as a pattern to be remolded. It's always a good idea if you're like me and you like to have several heads around to work with. I always like to keep a library of these heads sitting around and it's much easier to store resin and foam heads than it is to store uh, plaster, hydrocal, or ultracal 30 heads. Now, in accordance with the prophecy, all the resin and foam materials I used in this video are available at bjbmaterials.com, so definitely check that out. And check out some of the material specs that go beyond what I can show in this video. So always check out the data sheet to see that. I try to put as much of that as I can cram in a video, but that definitely makes for some pretty dry watching. So any further material questions, be sure to check it out at bjbmaterials.com.